Documentary filmmaking and lights have a bit of a complicated relationship, and it can be hard to know where they fit into an industry where you're supposed to be out there capturing reality and not crafting a scene on a Hollywood soundstage. But after working in this business for over 10 years and learning from some of the best DPs out there along the way, I can tell you that using different kinds of lights in your doc shoots can make a huge difference in the production value of your finished film. But with literally hundreds, if not thousands of options to choose from these days, when you're starting to build out your lighting kit, it can be hard to know which ones are worth the investment. So in this video, I'm gonna get into the different kinds of lights that I use for documentary production, uh, what sorts of situations I'd use them in, which ones are my standout favorites, and at the end, I'll suggest which order I'd buy them in if I were starting over. So let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back. And if you're new here, my name is Luke Forsyth, and on this channel, I teach the skills I've learned over 10 years working as a documentary filmmaker and photographer. If you're into that kind of thing, think about hitting the subscribe button because I've got new videos coming out every Wednesday. Before I say anything, I just want to give a big thank you to everyone for helping me get this channel over the 10,000 subscriber mark. It's been such a great experience making these videos and growing this community. So thank you for all being a part of it. That also means that the applications for the 2023 mentorship program are now closed. And thank you to everyone who applied. I think there's close to 50 applications in total. So please be a little patient with me while I go through them all, but I will get there eventually. I'm really looking forward to working with one of you soon. All right, let's get into the video. Let me just say right off the bat, this is probably the best time ever to be a documentary filmmaker when it comes to lighting options. In documentaries, we usually can't have a dedicated lighting truck or a team of electricians on hand like you might on a Hollywood set. And portability is probably just as important as output. If you can't get the light to the location or if it takes a dedicated generator to run it, odds are it's not gonna be very useful. It used to be that film lights used massive bulbs and required a ton of power, making them pretty much impractical for running gun shooting. But thanks to all the innovations in LED technology in the last 10 years, these days we're spoiled for choice. LEDs are lightweight, they don't draw a lot of power, meaning you can plug them into the average wall outlet without blowing the power grid, and they're getting better and better every year. But not all LEDs are created equal, and there are so many different kinds and companies to choose from then it might not be very clear which ones you should be looking at. At least it wasn't for me when I first started adding lights to my kit. The most common time in a doc shoot where lights are almost guaranteed to come out is during interviews. For a lot of documentaries, the interviews are the narrative backbone of the story. And since we often keep coming back to them again and again, it's in your best interest to try and make them look as good as possible. There are a lot of different ways to set up interviews, so I'm not gonna get into all of them in this video, but comment down below if you'd like to see me make a dedicated video on interview setups. For the sake of keeping things to a manageable length in this video though, let's assume that your interviews have at least a key light and a backlight, which is the most common setup I often use in my own interviews. Sometimes there's a fill light thrown in there as well when I want a bit of a brighter look overall, but for me personally, a key and a backlight are usually enough for the look that I like. The key light is the main and usually the brightest light, and it's normally set up in front and just off to the side of the subject like I'm doing in this shot. You can change the angle of light to either get flatter, more frontal light or more off to the side for a more dramatic shadowy look. Those are personal creative choices and you're gonna have to experiment to see what works for you and your taste. But what most key lights have in common is that they're big and soft. That means using relatively powerful lights and pushing them through some sort of diffusion like a softbox. I'll just grab a quick phone video here so you can see what it looks like from my perspective, but you can see it's a pretty big light and I think the total diameter of the softbox is 38 inches, so almost four feet. Soft light from a big source smooths out shadows and is generally flattering to faces compared to small sources without diffusion, which can be really harsh looking. So when choosing a key light, I'd suggest grabbing the most powerful spotlight style one you can afford that will accept a standard softbox attachment. There are a lot of different companies that make uh, chip on board style LED lights, but I personally use ones from Aperture and now Small Red. My biggest light and the one I'm using right now for this video is the Aperture 300D Mark II with the Light Dome 2 softbox attachment. Aperture were pioneers in the affordable LED lighting game, and I'm guessing most people have heard of these, and they're really popular for a reason. I find the 300D to be a good balance between portability and power, and I can also take the softbox on and off uh, and just point it into the ceiling to brighten up a dim room. Just make sure you get a softbox like the Light Dome um, or some sort of diffusion system because this light on its own is way too strong to make faces look good. If I needed a really powerful key light for pretty much all interview scenarios, I think the 300D Mark II is about as good as you can get. Backlights, on the other hand, are placed behind the subject and their main purpose is to separate the subject from the background, which makes a 2D image look more 3D. If you look at a lot of interview setups, you'll start to notice subtle highlights coming from behind and on the opposite side of the key light. 
and that's a backlight, sometimes also called a rim light or maybe a hair light, depending on who you talk to. Whatever you want to call it, backlights are really helpful when you want more separation and depth in your interview setups, and I think that's something we pretty much all should strive for. Now, for a backlight, you don't need something so powerful, and these days I'm usually using this guy, which is the Small Rig 120D. I always knew Small Rig as more of a hardware company, and I have a lot of their 15 millimeter rails and monitor mounts and stuff like that, but they've also branched off into LED lighting tech as well. To be honest, when Small Rig sent me this 120D, I wasn't really sure what to expect, but I have to say that I've been pleasantly surprised. The build quality is great, the controls are well laid out and make sense, and it uses the same Bowens mount as the Aperture lights, meaning I can use the same softboxes for both. It also comes with a really nice travel case, and overall the whole package is just really nice and professional. It also sells on B&H for under $250, I think, which is mind-blowing to be able to get a light this good for so cheap. You could get three of these uh, for less than the price of my 300D, and for new filmmakers or content creators, that could open up some really cool lighting possibilities on a budget. You could also use this as a key light with a decently big softbox, so if you're traveling and want to save space, this could be a good option as well. It's going to be really interesting to see what plans Small Rig has for their lighting lineup. And if this is one of their earlier attempts, I'm guessing that eventually they're going to become a major player in the budget lighting game as well. So thanks to Small Rig for sending me this one. It's definitely going to see some heavy use. Big lights like these are great for interviews and lighting up dark rooms, and you could also blast them through windows to simulate sunlight even when it's dark outside. Of all the lights I'm going to talk about today, they're the most powerful, but they also need to be on stands for the most part, and that makes them a little impractical for some situations. Like let's say you wanted to get inside of a car or easily get a light shining down from the ceiling without using a super complicated grip setup, or maybe you're in a room so small that the stands would be in the shop. For that, you need something a little bit lighter and with a different form factor. Now, LED panels like this are a great solution for situations like I'm talking about. Unlike the last two lights where all of the light diodes were packed into a small chip for maximum directional output, panels like these are more spread out and spaced evenly on these flexible mats. They don't have as much power as a chip on board light, but they're much easier to fit into weird places. Uh, they come in a bunch of different sizes and they're my go-to for situations when the big lights just don't work. The first LED panels I got were these ones, which are one by one bicolor ones from Westcott. And I've been using them for almost six years at this point. They're flexible, um, magnetic, waterproof, and small enough to fit in a backpack or even gaff tape on a ceiling. Or you can even roll them on a tube, stand them in the corner, uh, on the dashboard of a car. The uses for these things are endless. They come with me on pretty much every shoot because they're so versatile and I can fit two of them with all the control boxes and cables into a small photography backpack. I also have a softbox and China cube attachment for them, so in a pinch they can be used as an emergency key light, though I wouldn't really do it if I had another option. That's really the main problem with these lights, is that they're just a little too small to be used for interviews. The China cube attachment, also from Westcott, does help quite a bit, and in my opinion, is a much better option than the softbox if you want to use these as a key light, but a one foot source is always going to be a bit small for my taste, and so if you have the option, I'd go for something a little bit bigger. And that's where this guy comes in. This monster is the Godox FL150R, and it's a four foot or 120 centimeter bicolor panel that solves a lot of the problems I have with smaller light panels. At four feet, you can get a much better wraparound effect on people's faces, which means it's not a bad option for a traveling key light when you need something light and that doesn't take up a lot of space. There's also a softbox and grid attachment that would make it even softer. Um, and considering that this thing fits into a tiny bag that's just about the size of the softbox I use on my key light, it's a really appealing option for people on the road. It's also less than half the price of the Westcott lights, which would normally set off some alarm bells with me, but I just took this thing up to the Northwest Territories with me on a shoot, and the build quality seems really solid. When Godox asked me which of their lights I'd be most interested in trying, this one jumped out at me because it's about the same size as a bank of Kino tubes, which were, and I guess still are, really popular in the filmmaking world. But a set of Kinos are huge and super heavy and relatively expensive, so something like this can get you most of the way there for a lot less money and weight. You could also gaff tape it to a window or hang it from the ceiling over a dining room table or go the other way and blast it upwards into the ceiling to light up a dark corner. There's a ton of cool possibilities with a light like this and I'd say for the price, it's a great bet for new filmmakers who need something a little bit larger than a one by one but still want to be portable. So thanks to Godox for sending this one. I'm pretty sure it's going to get used a ton. Okay, moving on from panels is the next kind of light you can think about adding once your key and fill lights are taken care of. 
And those are tubes. You could also make the argument that light tubes could be used as a fill light, but I'd probably try avoid using these as a key if I could help it. And since so much of dock lighting is about interviews, I'd make sure you have a nice soft key light before moving on to tubes. Now there's a couple things that tubes can do well in my opinion. For one, they're shaped really well for hand holding. Uh, and since they run on batteries, it's really easy to pass this thing off to someone else. And even if they have no filming experience, they can get the idea pretty quick. Because of the shape of this thing and the frosted coverings, they produce a slightly softer light relative to their size than light panels. And if you have someone to handhold them for you, just ask them to step closer or further depending on how much light you need. I also like to put these things on Gorilla Pods, uh, and then they can get really easy to just pick up and move around a room to fill in dark corners, or maybe give off a bit of backlight, or simulate an off-camera source. I use these tubes from Westcott uh, called the Ice Light, and I really just got these because I had a great experience with the Westcott light panels and because of another DP I knew had them. The advantage is that they're really well built and with metal end caps, and for their size, they're super bright with a solid battery. But I'm honestly not sure I'd buy them again if I were just starting out, mainly because they're not bicolor, so you have to use gels on them if you need something warmer than 5500K. This means they can be a lot brighter than tubes that have multiple colored diodes. And for me, the build quality and raw output of them make it worth keeping around. But for new filmmakers who don't wanna mess with gels, there are so many other companies that make tubes that are bicolor or even full RGB that I don't know if I'd recommend these if you're just starting out. I try really hard not to just throw away gear that still works for the newest and best thing. But if I didn't already own these and wanted a super high quality set of tubes that was bicolor, I'd probably get the set of three Quasar Science tubes. The kit comes with three different size lights so you can fit them into different spots. And Quasar has a long history of having really accurate colors in their lights. I'll put links to all this stuff in the description, by the way. Aperture is also releasing a light tube called the MT Pro, I think. And with Aperture's history of changing the lighting game again and again, this could be a cool one to look out for if you think you might want full RGB. I actually asked Aperture uh, if I could try one of these out for this video, but so far, no luck. Personally, I'm just gonna keep the ones I have for now because, well, I already have them and they still work great, but you should have a look at the different options and see what might work best for you. All right, I'm gonna wrap this up before this video gets way too long with one final kind of light category, and that's what I'm gonna call tiny lights. I'm not sure what the official name for these should be, but I'm talking about small fixtures with internal batteries that comes in all shapes and sizes, and can usually fit into your pocket. These are the lights that are six inches or smaller and can be used for a ton of different stuff. I have a few different ones like these two different sizes from Aladdin and also this Aperture MC. I like to use them as an eye light during interviews um, or to handhold as a backlight during macro or detail shots or whenever I just need a little pop of light in a tight space. The Aladdin lights are built out of solid metal and are about the most rugged design of any small light I've ever found, but the trade-off is that they're expensive. The MC isn't quite as tough, but it's way cheaper. It's full RGB and it has built-in effects. If I'm being honest, about 99% of the time, I just use this light for the effects and I find them super helpful. Like if I'm filming near a campfire, I'll just stick this thing on a gorilla pod set to the fire effect mode and it'll add a ton of fill while still looking realistic. It also does TV flicker and lightning and police lights, all of which can be really hard to replicate manually. It's not as bright or tough as the Aladdin's, but for the effects alone, I think it's worth it. Even though they're not quite as nice, if I were starting to build my kit again, I'd probably just go with these to be honest, especially if budget is an issue. There are a ton of other companies who make small lights, so this is not an exhaustive list by any means. I know people seem to like falconize lights a lot as well, but I've never tried them. If you have a favorite tiny light, let me know in the comments. Okay, so if I were starting to build up a lighting kit from scratch, what order would I buy these in? Well, the first I'd say, hands down, is definitely a key light because documentary filmmakers need to shoot a ton of interviews, like I said. Something like the Aperture 300D or the Small Rig 120D would both be great choices. Just make sure you get a softbox attachment. I'd get the most powerful one you can afford because it will be the most useful if you need to light a room or fight against the sun. But then they take out more space in transit, so that's also something to think about. Next, I'd probably get a panel light of some sort. A one by one is great for portability, but something like that Godox 150R I mentioned has a lot more output and could potentially replace your key light if you're really trying to save weight. After that, I'd say go with one or two tiny lights, probably an Aperture MC or two, just because they fill a role that the key light and panel lights can't because they're so small. Whatever tiny light you go with though, I'd highly suggest getting one with effects because I use them way more than I ever expected. Lastly, I'd say get a tube or two if you think you'll use them. I'm putting tubes at the end of this list, not because I don't use mine, because I do all the time. 
Tubes are great, but with a key, a panel, and some sort of tiny fixture, you can get pretty much all the same results. Tubes are still really helpful, and if you're getting more and more into lighting, I'd say add them for sure. But if you're just starting out and the price tag is getting a bit much, I might hold off for a while. Let me know in the comments if you disagree with the order though. I always love to hear what people are using and how. All right, that's it. My take on some of the best lights for documentary filmmakers to look at at the end of 2022, which ones I personally use, and what order I'd buy them in if I were starting again. There's links to everything I mentioned in the description and as always, if you found that video helpful, think about subscribing to the channel or giving the video a like so the algorithm gods give me some love. And if you did like that video, you might also like this other one I made about gear I use to film in harsh environments. See ya.